In 807, a distress signal was intercepted, originating in the Chiagamore system. A ship was rapidly sent to rescue the crew in danger, but no one knew at the time the endless consequences it would have on the Pharangian exchange dominion. Indeed, to the surprise of the rescue crew, it was members of a known species who called for help. This routine mission ended up to be the first contact post locks for the Pharangian civilization. The damaged ship belonged to an empire called the Imperium of Sigma. When the Pharangian captain arrived on their capital planet, Sigma Draconis, towing the damaged ship with a tractor beam, she was logically welcomed with delight by their space controller. Following this, it was an easy task to build the foundations for ties between the two civilizations. And soon, a delegation of diplomats was sent. Their mission was obviously to focus on trade, to fulfill the destiny offered by the Lux Conservers. It took only a few weeks for the Pharangian envoys to realize that the Emperor of Sigma was convinced of his superiority over the rest of the galaxy, and that he saw himself as its rightful leader. However, they also realized that the world below him was rigged by corruption and a constant struggle for power. Between the various government officials, the massive extortion of favors and substantial bribing was highly rewarded, and the first Pharagian trade branch was opened in 811, just four years after first contact. In deep contrast, this period of trading satisfaction clashed with the constant trouble that the Pharangian government had with a separatist movement. At the time, the location of the rebel base and shipyard was known. But it was also known that it would take an impressive attack fleet to destroy it. Assembling this fleet was taking years. In 817, the Imperium of Sigma sent a message. They had destroyed some hostile facilities on a remote planet before realizing that they sheltered Pharangian citizens. This meant an anticlimactic end to the separatist claims, even if one ship was detected escaping the system. Tracking and finding this ship, which was believed to be piloted by the separatist leader, became priority number one. This mission was quickly accomplished and the targeted ship intercepted and boarded. However, the outlaw who had guided the separatists for almost 15 years had committed suicide, bringing a tragic end to a path. The following decade was one of discovery for the Pharangians. As the exchange dominion established diplomatic relations with two new alien civilizations. First, the Voyan Protectorate governed a planet which had suffered an apocalyptic event approximately a century ago following a world war. The society which emerged from the catastrophe revered death, sacrifices and necromancy. Despite these unwelcoming and gruesome inclinations, the Voyan Protectorate lacked of everything on their lifeless world. And they were thrilled when the Pharangian Exchange Dominion established many trade branches in the major cities of the planet. Second, the Mexo Free Front was a far more complex civilization to understand. They did not seem to have individual wills. Instead, they pretended to be connected to what they called the Life Tree on their own world. Even if they allowed Pharangian scientists on their planet, they claimed they already had everything they needed and did not wish to trade with the Exchange Dominion to their great disappointment. In 333, a delegation of envoys from the Voyan Protectorate, the Mexo Free Front, and the Pews landed on Farange. The Pews were a before unknown civilization. They were profoundly spiritual and presented themselves as pacifists with a simple way of life, yet open to other cultures, even if they were deeply different from theirs. The group of envoys had come to the Pharangian homeworld to advocate for the creation of a galactic community that would gather all the major powers of the galaxy. The Pharangian government welcomed this proposition with great enthusiasm, 
To them, this community meant more contexts and therefore more trade in order to serve the LOX conservers. When the first session of the Galactic Community was held less than a year later, the hopes of the Pharangian Exchange Dominion were met on every aspect. They realized they knew little about the variety of inhabitants in the galaxy, and the Galactic Community was the perfect opportunity to fill this gap. During the next decades, the Pharangian Exchange Dominion constantly focused its political energy on trying to facilitate trade on a galactic scale, especially by deregulating markets and tearing down norms set by any individual government. The year 836 was a turning point in Pharagian history, as robots joined its population for the first time. The government had allowed their production because they represented a perfect labor force with no rights whatsoever and a great gain of productivity for the exchange dominion. The opening of the first robot factory was welcomed with joy by the Pharyngian population, and soon robotic startups flourished everywhere on the planet. By 850, and thanks to their work in the galactic community, the Pharyngians had finalized trade deals with every major political force in the galaxy. Only two exceptions remained, the Mexo Free Front, restrained by their collective conscience, and the Temasian Union. The latter was the main opponent of the Pharangians in the galactic debate. Their religion forbade any robotic involvement in society, and they relentlessly tried to impose their specific vision to the rest of the galaxy. Even if it had remained peaceful for the time being, Pharangian intelligence believed that they would not hesitate to go to war if necessary. Moreover, Pharangian spies had discovered that they were not a true democracy and that all the elections were rigged. Real power was the privilege of a secret council who drove the Temasian Union from the shadows. Despite these two setbacks, the Lox conservers seemed proud of the rapid trading expansion of their wards. They rewarded the Pharangians with a new fleet of starships, five times more powerful than the entire firepower they had before. In 866, for the 30th anniversary of the first robot produced on Farange, the government made two significant announcements to the population. First, their scientists had discovered and mastered gene therapy. Every citizen could now go to a gene clinic and have his DNA enhanced. The Pharangian leaders believed it would make them more effective as a species and therefore more worthy to the LOX conservers. Second, after years of engineering and building troubles, the first space habitat was ready to welcome its first settlers. It was designed as the solution to solve the overpopulation problem that Farange was suffering from and was presented as the next step in the development of the exchange dominion. But the next decade was synonym of a stopping point. The 870s implied disappointment for the Pharangians. A bill to form the Galactic Council was passed in the Galactic Community. The Council was constituted of three elected members who were given higher power in the community. The Pharangian diplomats were convinced they would be elected as indicated by many polls. But the outcome was surprisingly different. High frustration followed as the exchange dominion now felt it had a secondary status in the galactic community, which had so far been decisive in its development. Also, the Pharangian borders experienced friction for the first time, with the Emar raiders incursions in their territory. These mercenaries did not seem to have a centralized government, but rather to be an addition of factions in competition with each other. They were ruthless, and would not stop in front of anything to get something they needed or desired. Therefore, the Pharangian government had no other choice but to reinforce their border defences to face this new threat. Thank you everyone for watching and listening to this episode. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel. See you soon for another episode 
of the Farange Exchange Dominion on Stellaris. See ya!